Hello, I'm Paul Bradshaw. And I'm Lauren Gray. Welcome to Viral History, your weekly fix of all things history. Coming up on this week's show, I sit down with writer, historian and heritage consultant, Dr Emma Wells. And we get another glimpse into the skills and crafts of our ancestors and ancient artisans. But first up, let's go to the news. New archaeological evidence suggests that medieval people believed in the living dead. A team from Historic England and the University of Southampton studied human remains found at Warren Percy, a deserted village in North Yorkshire, and found evidence that corpses had been burnt and mutilated. The practice was carried out, researchers believe, to stop corpses arising from their graves. And a unique example of 15th century printed text has been unearthed at the University of Reading. The pages are from a priest handbook dating to around 1476 and are from one of the first books printed in England by printing pioneer William Caxton. Now, Dr Emma Wells is a medieval historian specialising in the building's history approach, which seeks to understand people through their surroundings. Viewers of Viral History will remember her as my medieval clothing consultant way back in episode one. And we sat down this time with her to talk about that most quintessentially medieval pastime, the pilgrimage. We've created these sort of pilgrim routes, these pilgrim ways. A lot of them have been sort of created um, as modern tourism trails, as it were. But how do they have sort of historical associations to these medieval saints? Um, or even these sort of ancient routeways. And how have they sort of transformed um, our landscapes and how have these sites sort of popped up along the ways um, over these hundreds, thousands of years? And so I wanted to see sort of how they've migrated, changed over time. And that was what sort of interested me. So there was nothing that really looked at that. Well, many of these uh, routeways were in existence in more historical times, i.e. before the medieval period. A lot of these were ancient um, old, and old drover's ways, um, so they have been in existence for, for thousands and thousands of years. So these sort of landscapes were carved out already for us. So I think medieval pilgrims probably just followed the routes that were already in existence because they were the safest We've got to think of, you know, safe ways as well, because we didn't have, you know, lit routes as we do to this day. Um, and also you had hazardous landscapes, whether it were wild dogs or um, whether you had people coming to steal whatever you may have on your person. So these were safe routes. They were also clear routes for you to follow because you didn't have the, you know, modern roadways as we do either. So they would follow and over time they changed and they were consistently followed. Therefore, they were carved into the landscape and therefore they became these very well-defined routes that became medieval pilgrim ways. And therefore, we still have them to this day. They're still even on some of the modern Ordnance Survey maps as well. Definitely an arduous journey, um, but it's, it's fantastic to see all of these places and to see how the landscape, even during the different seasons, how they change and how they'd have impacted the pilgrim at, if they'd have done it at different points in the year and how different sites appear out of the wilderness, out of the landscape at different times and how that impacts you as a person walking over them, as a pilgrim walking over them as well and how, even just in a sort of architectural historical sense, how you can see different things and how they sort of work together in an experiential sense is fantastic. And we look forward to collaborating with Emma Wells again soon on a brand new top secret project. Next up on Viral History, we travel back to the dim, distant past once again to learn more about skills and crafts of our ancestors in our weekly segment, Ancient Artisans. and welcome back to Ancient Artisans where we're in this wonderful setting known as the Earth House and we're here with Caroline from Pario Gallico which is a historical food catering company. Um, Caroline, can you tell us about some of these wonderful 
this spread that we've got in front of us? <laughs> yes, certainly. Um, well, I would like to begin with uh, what I call the blood bread. I call it black bread as well. Uh, yes, there is real blood in it, but from pigs. Okay, <laughs> no sacrifices. Not sacrifices. <laughs> um, it's actually a real archaeological experiment. Uh, it's unfortunately not Iron Age, which is the food I present today. It's based on a Viking find made in Sweden, where uh, a flatbread basically was found in a, in a grave. And after analysis, it contains animal blood and a very strange type of yeast that you can find in ales, beers or breweries, which makes sense for all the, uh, all the historical bread I will be making and made even the sweet one <laughs> that we might taste afterwards, uh, is actually not using yeast, but using uh, the ale bone, mm -hmm. so the sediment at the bottom of the keg of ale when you brew, to raise your bread. Okay, and what does the, what's the difference between the blood bread and, uh, and, and these breads here then? Um, well, that's the difference of rye flour or wheat flour, but essentially the interest is you don't have to kill an animal to make blood bread or black pudding, mm -hmm. if you want. Uh, you can just, like the... Maasai tribe in Africa, or the Mongols, well, in Mongolia, and things like that, um, in different culture, puncture the neck uh, of an animal, take a bit of blood, cauterize, and here they go. And I'm trying to present that seasonality is very important, and we are really at the end, end of winter, end of spring, so you can't kill your animals anymore, for they will give you milk, or eggs, babies, and uh, labor in the fields. So that's a good way of having iron and nutrients uh, added to your diet without killing anything. This bread, I'm going to be honest, appeals to me more. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about this one. Uh, this one is what you would maybe call a brioche type of bread. We call it an enriched bread. It's exactly the same as usual. Wheat flour, bit of water, pinch of salt, but you add butter and eggs, the new ones that you have, and fruits that you kept from the winter prunes, dried cherries, elderberries, and flax seeds, for example, to give a nutty taste. Um, so very much like a brioche with a bit less butter, I have to say. I'm going to, I'm <laughs> going to try an ancient piece of bread here then, hopefully not from the era 5,000 years old. Or wow, no, I would be very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's beautiful. Oh. And the fruits add that real sweetness to it as well, don't they, which is yes. beautiful. Mm. Of course you will have honey, you're right, but if you don't have honey, just dried fruits are so sweet uh, for ancient palates that it really, really makes a big difference at the end of a meal. Mm. Well, I've noticed that the children are really enjoying this one. <laughs> um, and they do look appetising. I notice you've put Moorish on it. What does that contain? Biscuits? Oh, yes. They are, mm, they are not crunchy biscuits. I think you will try one, maybe, if I get <laughs> <laughs> If you insist. Um, oh, yeah, I, I really do. They are made out of broad beans um, that replace... Um, a Celtic bean that we really struggle to find nowadays in, uh, in modern shops. So broad beans, wheat flour, flax seeds, really, I really do love them, and butter and honey. Um, basically, when you don't have a lot of grain left in your larder or your granary, you will use any kind of pulses and reduce them into flour or puree them to add to breads or, um, or porridges and things like that. I mean, that's, that's really lovely. That could, that's quite savoury, actually. It would go nice ah. with some cheese as well. <laughs> as well. And you notice that I have some cheese. I do. <laughs> but is this, this is quite an interesting um, arrangement, really, because I think our ideas might be that the, um, the food would have been really bland. But here you're showing us that actually it's remarkably appetising. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, that's one of the ideas. That's really what I want to transmit to everyone. You don't have to have just the same boring gruel or porridge, and you hear that all the time mm. through the reenacting world, or um, even, yeah, even for historians, archaeologists, and cooks as well. Mm. You can make something very simple, but very tasty, and you have native herbs, if I may. Uh, for example, you have wild garlic, um, wild garlic you have good. salt, mm. so salt, white garlic, thyme and sage, flax seeds, roasted barley malt, and if you think about mustard seeds, cumin, even coriander, you can have them. Wow. Yeah, so they were importing this, were they? Oh, they are native to Britain. Mm. But if you want to go to imports, oh, you can have black pepper mm. from India through the Roman. So you can trade with Romans, and you do, and you go so much further. 
but I actually hid it, but I'm, well, posh enough to have a bit of glassware and olive oil. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so as a, as a Iron Age British person, that would be a sign of, well, contact with the Roman world, mm. certainly, and a fair amount of wealth, I have to say. Oh, great. Well, this is just fascinating because I never knew that mustard seeds were, were in Britain at the time, which is great. So I've learned a lot from you today. <laughs> thank <laughs> you so much, Caroline. You're and thank you for good. letting me uh, eat all of your Please food. Do enjoy. <laughs> and thank you again for joining us, guys. We'll see you next week for another episode of Ancient Artisans. Eleventh of May. The great commoner William Pitt the Elder, first Earl of Chetham, died today in 1778. Well, that's about it from us for this week. And if you enjoyed this week's show, feel free to hit the subscribe button, follow Viral History on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, like this video and come back next week and visit us in our splendid Tudor lodgings. And remember, what's past is prologue. See you next week. Now, Dr. Emma Wells is a medieval historial. <laughs> <laughs> historial. Look up. No. Now, Dr. Emma Wells. <laughs> Hello guys and welcome back to Ancient Artisans where we're in this wonderful setting known as the Earth House with uh, your name, uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> and if you enjoyed this week's show, feel free to hit the subscribe button, follow Viral History on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, like this video and come back and visit us in the... Uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs>